In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the presence of market power for imperfect competition. So if we recall back to our continuum of market structure, we had perfect competition on the left, we had monopoly on the far right, and then in the middle we had these two guys, monopolistic competition and oligopolies. Jointly, we refer to these two as imperfectly competitive. We'll talk about what they mean individually for each one. Uh, to start off here, we'll take a look at monopolistic competition. So what monopolistic competition is really getting at, what we are trying to evaluate in this situation is really our, typically our restaurants, right? Our restaurants, uh, why do burgers, why are they all different prices? Why are they all slightly different depending if you go to McDonald's, A&W, etc.? How come cars are all a little bit different? How come they all have different prices depending on why, where that you are? Why aren't they just cars? Why aren't they just burgers? We'll take a look at all of that together. In a future video, we'll take a look at our other imperfectly competitive market, the oligopolist, and we'll take a look at that guy separately. Our objectives, what we're really interested in solving as we move through this video. So first, I want to determine profit at, an optimally, at the optimal level of output for a monopolistically competitive firm. So, okay, that means we need to figure out what makes a monopolistically competitive firm different from a monopoly. What makes a monopolistically competitive firm different from a perfectly competitive firm? So we'll need to take a look at each of these things. And then once we have that, we then need to go and say, okay, where is our optimal level of output? How do we determine that? What is our Q star? What's gonna be the corresponding price? Once we have that figured out, well, we can carry on and we can identify what the impacts of this imperfectly competitive market are on social welfare. That is, technically, as we'll see, these markets, these uh, firms that are monopolistically competitive, they have market power, thus they will cause a market failure. Finally, to wrap up, we'll take a look at monopolistically competitive firms and we'll take a look at their ability to earn profit in the long run. And if we go back to those determinants of market structure, keep in mind one of our determinants that we assumed for monopolistic competition was zero barriers. That is, there were no barriers to enter or exit. So hopefully you can rationalize what that means about the long run profitability. We've brought up the roles of barriers and long run profitability a few times now. Hopefully you can draw those connections. If not, we will be explicitly going through that in this video as well. So. Without any further ado, let's jump over, let's start taking a look at this market structure and what makes it so special. Okay, so characteristics of market structure. So really, if we go back and we want to take a look, when we're talking about monopolistic competition, let's write this down, monopolistic competition, and I'll just abbreviate that, monopolistically count. What we're looking at in this case is we are looking at lots of small firms. So again, right, we started off with perfect competition, lots of small firms. We jumped over to monopoly, which was only one big firm. We're now back again to lots of small firms. With these lots of small firms, they are going to have a product differentiation. And this will be, truthfully, we could say slight product differentiation. That is, the consumer does differentiate. The consumer does say, yeah, yeah, Toyota Camry, that is different than a Honda Civic. They're both just sedans. They're both very similar kind of cars, but the consumer still differentiates and says, no, they are different vehicles. Same kind of idea. A&W has their teen burger, McDonald's has their Big Mac, they're both burgers, but there's that slight differentiation between the two. So there is an element of product differentiation. Finally, we're going to say that there are no or limited barriers. And in this case here, our focus will be on the no barriers just for simplicity. But keep in mind, there are sometimes looking at monopolistically competitive firms, there are sometimes barriers that exist. Why is this market structure important? Why do we want to go through this, right? We've taken a look at one extreme perfect competition, we've taken a look at the other extreme monopoly. Well, 
monopolistically competitive firms, monopolistically competitive market structures are crucially important for us to be studying because it is estimated that about approximately two thirds of Canadian goods and services are provided through monopolistically competitive markets. So that is this really would be the dominant market that we witness around us, right? It'd be, we should maybe back that up. It's not quite two thirds. Instead of saying approximately two thirds, I should say that it is less than two thirds is being provided by monopolistically competitive. Big chunk of that rest is oligopolies. Oligopolies make up a large share of the Canadian market. So we'll get to what that means in a future video. With the remainder left over, well, the remaining leftovers shared between monopolies, mostly natural monopolies here in Canada, and perfectly competitive firms. But by far and large, this is our largest provider of goods and services. So an important market structure to be able to evaluate. Okay, so we have our basic kind of characteristics of market structure for our monopolistically competitive firm. Big thing to keep in mind again is our key assumption of firm behavior. That is why do firms exist? And again, our key assumption of firm behavior is that firms exist to maximize profit. So again, that's really what we want to get at. That's really what we want to go back and take a look at is how are they going to maximize their profit? what decisions are being made to do so. So two big things, right, that we'll have to carry forward with that. Next, next, let's take a look at the name because the name here is at first a little deceiving. People get kind of thrown off by this name, but then it actually really helps us to understand what's happening here. So we have monopolistic competition. So what's in the name here? What's in the name? Well, first of all, monopolistic. Monopolistic because each firm, each firm has a monopoly, right? And that is each firm has a monopoly over their version of the good that they sell because each firm has kind of differentiated their product just slightly right? Only Coffee Crisp sells Coffee Crisp. Only Kit Kat sells Kit Kat. There's other ones that try to come close, right? There's kind of your knockoffs of your Reese's Cups. Nothing's quite the same as a Reese's Cup. So because everyone has a monopoly over their specific good, well, they have a little bit of limited market power on it. Nobody else can make a Big Mac. Other people can make burgers, but a Big Mac is trademarked by McDonald's. Right, so in that sense there, they have a monopoly over their specific good or service. They've slightly differentiated it, differentiated it enough that the consumers believe that good A is different than good B. So, okay, that's the first bit. They have a monopoly. The second bit though, is that they're still in competition. And what competition means is that their profit will be driven to zero. Uh, we'll go driven to zero. And that is we're going to have this competitive behavior where firms are going to be looking, hey, where is their positive profit? Where can I enter? Where can I compete in order to get at that positive profit and ultimately drive it to zero? So in this case here, if the burger market is looking really favorable, if the burger market, if people in that market are making tons of economic profit, well, that's going to be incentive to enter that burger market to make your version of a quality burger. And by doing so, we have more and more versions of burgers existing. As these more and more versions of burgers exist, this increases the number of substitutes we have. Hey, now I'm not just substituting between a Big Mac and a teen burger. I'm now substituting between a teen burger, a Big Mac, and a Whopper or add in more, add in more, right? Every time we add in another player, we have more and more substitutes. The more and more substitutes we have, the closer and closer each of these other burgers become to each other, and the less differentiation we have between goods. The less differentiation we have between goods, right, is there's more and more competition, that profit is gonna be driven towards zero, right? And again, that no barriers is what's gonna allow that, what's gonna allow that to happen. So, Big thing in this, in this case here, we expect because we have lots of small firms, each with a monopoly over their good, but lots of small firms all competing, very similar products, slightly differentiated. 
what we would expect to witness is we would expect to witness elastic demand curves. Right, again, to keep in mind what elastic means, that is just fancy for sensitive to the price. And right in this case here, if McDonald's were to suddenly hike the price of a Big Mac, sure, there are some Big Mac diehards who would keep buying McDonald's Big Macs, but lots of people would say, hey, that's cool, you want to raise the price. I don't see a ton of difference between a Big Mac and a Teen Burger, a Big Mac and a Whopper. They're all just fast food burgers. Ah, uh, you want to charge that higher price? I'm sorry. I'm going to substitute towards this close alternative. So in that case there, we're elastic. The quantity demanded is sensitive to a change in the price. And it's not going to be perfectly elastic, like perfect competition. But we would expect a monopolistically competitive market to have a more elastic demand than, say, a monopolist. In the case of a monopolist, they can change the price. And your only option is either you buy it or you don't buy it. You don't have a substitute to go to in the case of a monopoly. Monopolistic competition, you do. You have lots of close substitutes to choose from. So kind of our, kind of our situation occurring there. What ends up happening for a monopolistically competitive firm? Let's go take a look at it. Again, monopolistically competitive firms, they compete. They compete over output right it's they choose a level of output as they choose a level of output there's a price attached to that output drives the price output drives the amount of labor they need thus output drives the costs right again if we wanted to see that firms are profit maximizing such that profit is total revenue minus total cost profit is price times quantity minus total variable cost plus our total fixed cost. In the short run, total fixed cost is fixed, so that just stays the same. Total variable cost, this here is a labor cost, such that our output, our quantity produced, is a function of labor and capital. Capital is fixed. So to get more output, I need more people, right? More people, more output. More people means more labor cost, thus higher total variable cost. So all of our costs in the short run are driven by our choice of output. What about price though? Well, let's take a look at that. So taking a look at our typical demand curve, we have our axes. Again, we have our price on the vertical, our quantity on the horizontal. And in this case here, right, like I said, a monopolistically competitive firm, it faces a demand for its good. Let's use an actual line here. It faces a demand for its good that's going to be relatively elastic. So I'm going to purposely draw this guy a little bit shallower than normal such that I have an elastic demand. That is little change in the price causing a drastic change in quantity demanded. Okay, what we would witness then if we take a look at this is if I were to choose some level of output, well, at that level of output, I get to charge based off of what my demand is, right? Why based off of what my demand is? Because that is the maximum willingness to pay. So of course I'm gonna charge what people are willing to pay as their highest. If I choose this quantity, I get to charge that price. Very similarly, as I move along, I can charge, I can, sorry, I could produce more stuff, but if I produce more stuff, that's gonna be corresponded to a lower price. So as we see, as I choose my quantity, I also end up choosing my price. So choice of quantity results in a choice of price, such that we have that relationship going on as well. So ultimately, just like in our perfectly competitive firms, just like in our monopolist, our profit maximizing decision, how we compete, how we determine how to profit maximize, all comes down to 
how much do I produce? Choice of output is the primary choice of the firm. So let's take a look really at where this works out to be. Let's take a look at a market, just a generic market to start off. So we'll take a look at a representative firm in a monopolistically competitive market. We'll have our price, we'll have our quantity on the horizontal, and we'll start off by taking a look at our cost curves. So keep in mind our cost curves, we're going to have our average variable cost, that is my labor cost per unit. I'll have my average total cost, that is my total cost per unit. And then connecting these two curves together will be my marginal cost up through the minimum of each of these guys, at least the best I can do freehanding. Not too bad. My total cost maybe should have been a bit to the left, but not so bad to freehand. We have the marginal cost coming up to the minimum, right? Keep in mind our cost structure is identical for all firms. All firms face these costs. There's a cost again that we are not explicitly drawing but can be implicitly pulled out of the diagram and that is of course the distinction, the difference, the vertical difference between the average total and the average variable cost curve and that is our average fixed cost. And again the reason why that is the case is because our average total cost is for any quantity the average variable cost plus the average fixed cost. So alternatively, average total minus average variable yields the average fixed. So vertical distance at any point yields that average fixed cost. Okay, well, what we want to take a look at is we want to figure out our optimal level of production. And let's start off taking a look at an optimal level of production for a representative firm in a monopolistically competitive market earning positive profit. That all was a mouthful, but let's take a look at it. Uh, what color do I want to use for my demand? Let's use let's use white for our demand curve here. Okay, so again, not going to be that big of a deal, but let's try to, for this sense here, make our demand curve be relatively elastic, that is relatively shallow sloped. So I'll go something like that, and that will yield for me my demand which is my average revenue or my price. Okay, downward sloping demand curve. Hey, I have market power. As I choose my quantity, I get a price. That means as my quantity changes, my price changes. That is my marginal revenues all over the place. Hey, I have a monopoly over my good. That means that really this diagram is gonna look just like a monopolist's diagram. That is, my marginal revenue will once again be twice as steep as my average revenue. That is, my marginal revenue will be twice as steep as the demand curve. So we could, we could draw that as well. Starting off at the same point here, twice as steep, let's, let's use the right tool here. Starting off at the same point, twice as steep, I would have a, I will say that's twice as steep, marginal revenue at a point like such. And I see here a little bit of a thing, that's price. I don't know how that turned into an R, but that's P for price at that point. Okay, so we have our, we have our firm, we have the representative firm in a monopolistically competitive market. We now want to identify their profit maximizing level of output and their corresponding price and all of that where they're sitting. So again, our profit maximizing condition, this is the same for all market structures. Profit maximization occurs where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right? So what we're looking for is we're looking for some Q star such that marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right? Keep in mind, we're always choosing a level of output, a level of Q. So marginal revenue, marginal cost, those two intersect right here, right, right there. That's my marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So at that point, what we want to do is we want to draw a line. Just want to draw a line to identify that. So we'll draw this line down and we'll draw it up just so it touches all of our different curves going through. 
And then we'll call that because, hey, that's marginal revenue goes marginal cost. That is Q star. Keeping in mind, for some quantity, we can now read off from this quantity all the different corresponding points. So to do so, we go up. And we hit the average variable cost curve first. So there we go. That would be my corresponding average variable cost. Carrying up again, I hit my average total cost. So that's my average total cost. Carrying up even more, I hit my demand curve. Keep in mind, that's my demand, my average revenue, or my price. So there is my price. To work out my profit, well, keep in mind, profit is total revenue minus total cost. We don't have any totals anywhere in here. We have averages. So, hey, we can just take the average of everything. So, divide everything by Q. Well, profit over Q, that'd be average profit, profit per unit. Total revenue over Q, that's average revenue. That's just equal to the price minus my total cost. Well. Total cost over Q, that's my average total cost. So hey, my profit per unit is just equal to price minus average total cost. That is this distance right here. Price minus average total cost. That guy, that's my profit per unit, my average profit. To get my total profit, well, to visualize this, I could just again, Take my average profit, multiply everything by Q. What Q do we multiply? Well, by Q star, of course. That's our profit maximizing level. So profit per unit times our number of units. Well, that just gives me my total profit again. And that will be price minus average total cost times my Q star. Which really, if we want to think about this, this is just saying, hey, profit is a rectangle. Where if we could write it this way, we could say that price minus average total cost, that's the height of my rectangle. Q star, that's my base of the rectangle, right? So if we take a look at that, again, like we said, price minus average total cost, that's this height here. Q star, that is this base. So that is this whole rectangle here. That is the size of my economic profit. So right there, we could go positive profit, positive economic profit being earned in this case. Okay, so that's our positive economic profit. Let's talk about what happens for this firm as we begin to transition to the long run. So in the long run, we have our traditional kind of case like what we would have with our perfectly competitive firms. That is, we have no barriers. That is again, no barriers. What this means, it's late at night on a hot summer day. You left the doors, you left the windows open and the lights on. All of the bugs have come inside to get that light. That's what no barriers is, right? All of these firms looked and they say, wow, we can make huge amounts of positive profit in this market. We want in there. We want to get at that market. So what begins to happen, positive profit, right? Well, this is the long run. If we have positive profit, no barriers, this attracts entry, like bugs to a light, attracts entry. As firms enter in this case though, what's happening is they're entering, but they're making their own version because every one of these firms creates their own version of what's happening, right? They're not all making Big Macs. They're all making their version of a burger. So as all this entry happens, we have increasingly diversified goods or services or services. That is, we have increased variability. That would maybe be a better word to use, increased variability. And with this increased variability means that we have more and more close substitutes. So increased diversified goods, increased variability. Now all of a sudden there's so many or there's more and more and more 
producers all making very similar goods that it becomes less and less apparent what the difference is between this good and that good, between this person's and that person's. All of this increase in the availability of substitutes. Well, now all of a sudden, maybe, maybe your thing was a Big Mac because before all you had to choose between was a Big Mac and a teen burger. But now all of a sudden the Whopper is, enters and you're like, oh wow, there's a Whopper. That is a good burger. Big Macs used to be my thing. I was eh, not too happy with teen burgers, all for the Big Macs. But now that there's a Whopper, that satisfies my craving. I now prefer the Whopper over the Big Mac. So as we have this increased variability, as these more and more substitutes come out, we have more and more goods that cater to our specific tastes and preferences. Before, we kind of had to just kind of fit our tastes and preferences into the, number, into the goods that were available. But more producers means a more specific product tailored for me. So what this means is that my demand, my demand for this existing good up here, right? I used to be maybe part of this demand for Big Macs, but now a new burger chain has opened up that has an amazing burger that's tailored just for my tastes, meaning that I am no longer part of this demand for Big Macs. My preferences, my tastes have changed. They're no longer for Big Macs. They're now for this new burger, meaning that as this happens, my demand begins to shift to the left. My demand begins to decrease. So demand shifts left, right? And we can think of that, all these close substitutes is changing our tastes and preferences. Changing our tastes and preferences away from the existing established goods towards the new entrance. So our demand is shifting left. And this really gets people. People get, why isn't the supply changing? We have people entering. We have new firms entering. This is more goods and services, more producers supplying burgers. Okay, the supply is not changing. And the reason the supply is not changing, let's go back up here. This is not, not the market for burgers. What this would be representing, this would be representing the market for Big Macs, right? So sure, if we had just this generic market for burgers and we lumped Big Macs, Teen Burgers, Whoppers, etc., etc., all into that same kind of, they're just burgers, we don't care about the differentiation, they're just burgers, well then, yes. In this case here, in the market for burgers, supply would have increased. But that's not what we're modeling here. We are modeling specifically the market for Big Macs. This is my demand for Big Macs. And because of these new entrants, this new burger joint is making that perfect burger just for me, meaning I'm no longer a Big Mac guy. I am now for that new burger. So in that case there, with respect to the market for Big Macs, my tastes and preferences have changed and my demand has shifted left. So distinction to be made there. And hopefully that clears up that, that common fallacy. So demand shifts left. As my demand shifts left, this causes the quantity exchanged to fall, right? That's going to be our Q star and this would be Q star, I guess we could say Big Macs, because that's what we're talking about now. And additionally, not only does our quantity, our optimal quantity of Big Macs fall, but so does our price of Big Macs, right? Our price of Big Macs also falls. And this continues, right? As long as price is above average total cost, we have positive profit. Positive profit attracts entry, we'll have more good, we'll have more firms entering, we'll have more diversified variability within our goods, on and on and on and on, demand shifting left, price dropping until price equals average total cost and our profit equals zero. And again, until our economic profit equals zero. That's, that's the big takeaway there. So what we would expect to be happening in this case. How does that look? How does that look modeling wise? Well, 
let's take a look at that. Let's model it. Let's see how this actually works through. So let's go and just start a new page. Let's redraw this from the start so that we can make it a little bit cleaner. So let's go jump over and take a look. So again, to start off, we want our axes. Let's go price and quantity. And we'll have our demand. And let's just actually start, not start with our demand. Let's just start with our cost curves. And I'm going to simplify our cost curves here. I'm just going to be looking at our average total cost and our marginal cost. And the reason I just want to simplify it just to these two is because, well, the marginal cost helps me determine Q star. The average total cost helps me determine profitability. All the average variable cost tells me in this case here is my labor cost per unit and my shutdown condition, right? That's all that my average variable cost plays into. Because I'm talking about a case of positive profit going down to zero profit, I don't have to worry about that shutdown condition. So I can ignore more or less that average variable cost in this case here. What do we then have? We then have a demand curve that is, we'll say something like that. We'll pretend that's the same scenario that we had just taken a look at. And a marginal revenue curve that's, oh, let's use an actual line, sorry. A marginal revenue curve that is twice as steep, maybe something like so. So to label them, we'll have our marginal revenue. Uh, let's keep our colors the same. We have our demand, our average revenue, or our price. Identifying Q star at this point. Uh, we haven't used green, so let's use green to identify Q star. Q star is where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. So that occurs right here. Take this point and draw a line through everything. What do we get? Well, all the way up to the demand, our willingness to pay, we get our price. And where this touches our average total cost curve, we get, of course, our average total cost. So price bigger than average total cost, we have positive profit. So okay, our whole scenario starts to work through. Price bigger than average total cost, positive profit, positive profit attracts entry. New entrants try to mimic that good, try to make their own versions of it. As they make their own versions of it, well, your tastes and your preferences begin to change. For some people, maybe they stay with the original good. For some, they're going to say, oh, I like that new version better. What this does is it changes the demand for the existing good, shifting it to the left. So let's work through what that does. Let me just get rid of this initial Q star and profit here. I didn't label it. Let's just quickly do that. This was my Q star. So that's what that point there was. But let's take a look at what happens. This guy here is going to shift left, shift left, shift left, shift left until we get to a situation about like so. Let me just kind of keep this within our axes here. There we go. I can erase this part here where I jump out of, whoa, erase the entire line. There we go. Get rid of that bit. What we have now, marginal revenue, our demand, and we can get our Q star again. Marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Drag that line all the way up. Oh, let's keep it a straight line. All the way up and across. And what we'd have is our Q star. And at this point here, we would have price equals average total cost such that, hey, if price equals average total cost, my profit is zero. Right, so in this scenario, demand is shifting left. If demand is shifting left, marginal revenue is shifting left. All of this continues, continues, continues until we are finding ourselves our demand curve just tangent to the average total cost curve, just touching it at some point. As it just touches it, 
that was going to be the point such that at our Q star, our profit maximizing level of output, we are earning zero profit. So let's compare and contrast this between where we're earning zero profit for a representative firm in a monopolistic competitive market versus same kind of case, zero profit in a perfectly competitive market. And let's kind of do this to kind of show, compare and contrast the differences. So again, price on the vertical, quantity on the horizontal. We'll do this again with just our average total cost and our marginal cost for a perfectly competitive firm. Keep in mind what's happening here. We have so many firms that are all producing the identical product, meaning everything is a perfect substitute. If one orchardist tries to raise the price of their apples, well, the other apples are perfect substitutes. You just jump to the other one. So in that case there, the view demand from the view of the producer at least is, let's make this a thick line like I did in the other case. Demand from the view of the producer is perfectly elastic and we get demand equals average revenue equals price. And in this case here, because it's perfectly elastic, twice as steep as this line is the same line. So we get also equal to our marginal revenue. Right, all we're doing, this is just our perfect competition. We've done this a hundred times. So at this point, identifying our Q star, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That occurs right there, yielding for us our Q star, carrying it back up. At that point there, we have our price equal to our average total cost. That is again, we have zero profit. So same scenario in both cases, zero profit. This is where we'd be in the long run in both of these firms, right? Competitive, competitive competition drives economic profit to zero. So where we'd be in each case. Distinction between the two. Distinction. This and our perfectly competitive firm, we earn zero profit at capacity right so at the firm's capacity that minimum average total cost is where we get the zero profit for a monopolistically competitive firm they're earning zero profit below capacity or to say that a different way they're earning their zero profit with excess capacity they have excess room to scale up their production and drop their cost per unit but their profit maximizing level of output is still below capacity. So distinction between those two. What does this mean on each of their respective long run curves then? Where, are each, where is each firm gonna find itself? Or I guess each representative firm gonna find itself? We can take a look. So let's take a look. Let's remind ourselves of these long run cost curves. We'll have our price, we'll have our quantity, we will have our long run average cost curve. Keep in mind the distinction between the two. Average total cost curve would be kind of U shaped. Long run average cost curve is said to be more saucer shaped, such that every quantity, right, every quantity up to here, this is representing our least cost production. This is our absolute lowest cost of production along this long run average cost curve. It would be impossible to have any short run average total cost sit below this curve. So this is our least cost curve. And again, the rationale as to why is because every quantity is being produced with that optimal ratio of labor to capital, right? That marginal product of labor over price of labor equals marginal product of capital all over price of capital. Perfect ratio being upheld there. So again, just some background reminder on what's happening with this long run average cost curve. Okay, to bring our points, right where we hit this flat stretch, this here is our minimum efficient scale. Okay, so we have our curves. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just cheat here. I'm gonna copy this guy and I'm just gonna copy paste it. 
and I'm just going to carry it over to here so we can kind of compare uh, where we are on each one of these. We can get rid of this bit that again was just a refresher to remind us of what is going on in this case here. So let's start off with perfectly competitive. So at perfect competition, I have a short run average cost curve such that I'm producing right at its minimum point. If we were to figure out the slope right at that minimum point, it would have a slope of zero. That is, it's right at its minimum. So similarly, the only point on this long run average cost curve that would match that exact same slope is right at our minimum efficient scale. Thus, what we would witness is we would witness our short run average total cost curve sitting right like that. And right at this minimum efficient scale here, that would be my Q star, such that this guy and that guy are one and the same, this representing it in the short run, this representing it in the bigger picture in the long run. Both cases though, zero economic profit. That is, if I'm earning zero economic profit in the short run because of where I've been driven to, this is where I'll find myself at the minimum efficient scale. What about a monopolistically competitive firm? Well, we'll see that our monopolistically competitive firm, they're operating in this stretch of our short run average total cost curve. That is, they're operating in a stretch with a negative slope. That is, my short run average total cost curve, all of these short ones are tangent to my long run average cost curve, such that they touch at one point where they share the exact same slope. So where they share the exact same slope is going to be where the slope is negative. That is, along this stretch here, I also have a negative slope on my long run average cost curve. So somewhere along here is going to be where the short run average total cost curve is. Taking a look, that could be a point such like this. There would be the short run average total cost tangent at some point below capacity such that that is going to be my corresponding value of Q star. That is, I'm going to be operating in this case of increasing returns or decreasing average costs. And I'll be operating not only below capacity or with excess capacity, I will also be operating below my minimum efficient scale. So bit of comparing and contrasting of our monopolistically competitive firm to our perfectly competitive firm. Okay, so monopolistically competitive firm earning positive profit, earning zero profit. We could take a look at one earning negative profit. Really, the only way that we would get that to happen is by having this demand curve sit below the average total cost curve. I trust that we can manipulate the diagram to make that happen. I'm not gonna go through that process here in this video. It would just be demand curve even farther to the left with respect to our average total cost, marginal cost. What happens though if we have negative profit? Let's at least talk through that. If we have negative profit, let's, uh, let's go back. Here we said, hey, long run, positive profit, no barriers, attracts entry, yada, 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 yada. Well, if we had negative profit, the opposite would happen in the long run. No barriers, so we're free to leave. If we're free to leave, we have less variability of goods, meaning we have fewer substitutes. If we have fewer substitutes, that good we really liked, it's now gone, meaning we now need to figure out which other burger we're going to eat. And now all of a sudden, we start to migrate back towards maybe Big Macs, back towards teen burgers or the like. As this happens, well, the demand will shift to the right. As the demand shifts to the right, Optimal output increases, price increases, until again, we wind up at zero profit from the other side. So same story, perfectly symmetrical, just in the opposite direction. Okay, does this actually work? Is this, do we actually witness this in action? And hopefully with just a little bit of thought, you can actually realize that yeah, yeah, we do witness this in action and quite frequently. And let's think this might be really a bit of a stretch going back quite a few years now. 
but if those of you who remember back when Apple first launched their iPad. Well, Apple first launched their iPad, the first real mass popular tablet computer, and it was huge, right? Everybody wanted an iPad. They were the big thing. And then within a few years, there was every kind of tablet computer. There was every version of tablet computer you could imagine. There was, okay, iPads running on the um, Mac iOS. There were Windows tablets that popped up by all sorts of different manufacturers, right? There's some of them being big names like Dell, um, Acer, and the like. Others being complete no-name, complete new entrance to the field. We then also saw with that the rise of Android tablets. Again, some from big names that you recognize, like our Samsungs and the like. Some from, again, completely new entrants. We also saw completely new tablets coming in altogether. We saw the Fire tablet from Amazon and many, many other different versions as well. There's actually even a few more if you wanted to really look at the history of it that all popped up. That is... Apple, they created their iPad. They were earning massive economic profit on it. They had a monopoly over the iPad itself, but not a monopoly over creating a tablet computer. All of these other firms, they witnessed, hey, wow, there's huge economic profit to be had here. And they all rushed to copy the iPad the best they could to offer their own slight differentiation of the iPad, thus eating into Apple's economic profit. Some people were like, yeah, I wanted a tablet computer, not a fan of the Mac iOS, the Apple ecosystem, but hey, I really like the Windows ecosystem. So, okay, boom. As soon as this one was offered, I was originally stuck in this category for demand, but now I get to migrate into a Windows one. Or, hey, I really hope there was an Android one. Same idea, right? Migrate our way over there. So as more and more entrants come in, there's that one that fits what we want. And as it fits what we want, well, we migrate our demand towards that one. Demand for iPads begins to fall. Same thing can be said for cars, right? We can look at cars in very much the same way. A handful of years ago, it was Tesla that really modernized and brought in the modern electric vehicle, right? Before Tesla, before the launch of the Model S, there really wasn't a lot of talk about electric vehicles other than just a little bit of pipe dreams. Well, Tesla launched their first real mainstream electric vehicle. Very short after that, everybody's offering their version. Right? All of a sudden, there's the Nissan, there's the Honda, there's the Mitsubishi, there's the Toyota, etc., etc., etc. Everybody has their version of the electric vehicle. Fast forward to today, and we have situations like Hyundai announcing that they're going to have an electric version of almost every vehicle in their lineup in the next few years. Right? Volkswagen's made very similar announcements. So, Tesla entered, they created this new kind of situation, was earning massive economic profits, if not any accounting profits, but massive economic profits. All of that attracted entry. All of that entry caused kind of a mimicking, uh, right? How do we make our version of this good? And we see it just proliferated through the entire vehicle marketplace. And we now have lots of different versions of electric vehicles offering different features and the like, depending on each individual's demand. Based off of that, what happens to the price of the initial EV, as Tesla was the only one offering it? Well, we'd expect the price to begin to fall. And sure enough, what have we witnessed with the price of Teslas over the last decade? We've witnessed the price falling. Now, okay, there's lots going on there. You can argue with me on that for sure. Right, this would be right as everything we do in economics, a cetris paribus kind of discussion. That there's downward pressure on the prices due to entry. Yes, there's also downward pressure on the prices due to Tesla moving into economies of scale. Yes, there's downward pressure on prices of Tesla as they're creating new technologies, etc., etc., etc. That's all there. That's all true. I'm just saying cetris paribus. The increase this. Differentiation, more and more variability. Well, people who are just like, I want an EV, Tesla's the only option. 
Well, now there's many different options and that demand is split between many more producers. So are monopolistically competitive markets in action? Okay, well, let's take a look at efficiency underneath monopolistic competition. So let's start off by taking a look, just like we did for a monopoly, let's start off by taking a look at a perfectly competitive market. So again, we have our market, we have price, we have quantity. There's our price, there's our quantity. And let's suppose, right, let's suppose this is the market for, I don't know, let's pick something ridiculous. Let's go back and say, let's take a look at apples. So if we're taking a look at the market for apples, we have our overall market demand for apples looking something like such. And then we have our corresponding market supply. Keeping in mind, this is also the marginal cost of the industry. Okay, as we go through this, we end up getting our equilibrium, quantity exchanged, and price. Keeping in mind that what then happens is for each individual firm, they witness this price and they take that market price and they go, hey, this is my price equals average revenue equals marginal revenue. And from the firm's perspective, this is the demand curve. So perfectly competitive, here we are, we are in equilibrium, perfectly competitive, allocatively efficient, right? At this quantity, we have a point such that my marginal benefit equals my marginal cost, or alternatively to say my price equals my marginal cost. So I'm allocatively efficient, great, yes, okay. Let's suppose there was some way, some way that apple orchardists figure out to begin to differentiate their products slightly. That is, they can now say, hey, I've packed extra vitamins and nutrients into my apple to make them that much better for you. And they're differentiated because these apples are purple or something like that, right? And every apple orchardist has been able to find their way to slightly differentiate their product to make their product different than the generic apple and thus be able to obtain a monopoly over their version of our generic apple. What happens, right? What happens in this case here? Well, all of a sudden we get now all of a sudden a monopoly over instead of just apples over this one specific type of apple. And we'll presume, right, just for simplicity, same demand. This is now just a representative firm. This is what they would have witnessed. Well, now, as they have their distinction, their distinct version of the apple, they now have their marginal revenue twice as steep. Where is that? We'll say twice as steep is about there. There's my marginal revenue curve twice as steep. What does this end up doing? Well, we find our profit maximizing level of output, marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And we go. Boom, boom, and what do we have? We have marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That is my Q star, my profit maximizing level of output underneath monopolistically competitive marketplace. Up all the way to my demand curve, that's my average revenue or my price underneath this scenario, giving me my price underneath a monopolistically competitive market. So what we witness is that as a firm is able to differentiate, as they're able to say, hey, my good's different than this good, and as consumers are able to see that, the firm obtains market power, able to push up the market price, and they're able to push up the market price because they're able to hold down their quantity produced. What does this do for surplus? Well, let's start off by taking a look. We have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H in this case. So let's take a look at before. So before our consumer surplus, our producer surplus, and our social surplus. So okay, initially, our producer surplus, or sorry, initially our consumer surplus, let's start with them. 
below my demand curve, above the price that I pay. So I'd get that triangle there as A, B, C, D, E. So, okay, consumer surplus would be A, B, C, D, and E. That's a plus. Our producer, on the other hand, above my willingness to accept, all the way out to the quantity exchanged, below the price I do accept. So my producers would be F, G, and H. Okay, social surplus then, everything added together. So my social surplus would be strictly A through H. So everything there, that's my social surplus. What about after? What happens after the fact? Well, again, we'd have our consumer, producer, and social surplus. Well, let's take a look at what's happening there. Let's just clean this up. Let's just get rid of that guy. Let's get rid of not too much. Just that guy. There we go. And let's re-highlight these. So starting off with our consumer surplus below my willingness to pay to the quantity exchanged. So now that's just quantity star monoplistically competitive. So there's my new consumer surplus. What is that guy? Just, just A and B. My new producer surplus. Well, my new producer surplus is above my willingness to accept all the way up to Q star. Up to the price I actually do accept, price monopolistically competitive, all the way down there. So in that case there, what do I have? C, D, F, G. C plus D plus F plus G. My social surplus then, that is A, B, C, D, F, and G. Meaning that society in this case is worse off Society actually loses E and H. That is our dead weight loss. Our dead weight loss to society, just like in a monopolist. And that's right, you're probably looking at this and you're scratching your head and you're going, oh my goodness, I am so, what's going on? What is the difference between what we've just looked at here and what we've looked at in our diagram with monopolist? How do I tell the difference between a monopolistically competitive firm and a monopolist? What, what's the difference here? Truthfully, just looking at the diagram, there's no good, easy way to differentiate between the two, right? The only real way to differentiate between the two is to have that background information about how many firms there are, what kind of goods they're selling, are they differentiated, are they not, and if there's barriers to entry. Technically, right, technically in this case, our demand curve would be more elastic than what we'd witness in a monopolist, but that's not always going to be apparent in the diagram. So that's not going to be a big telltale sign. That is, if we're just looking at this diagram, well, the diagram of a monopolistically competitive firm and the diagram of a monopolist is going to be identical, right? There's going to be no kind of distinguishing features between the two diagrams. So the difference between the two all comes down to the theory behind the two the theory about entry, exit, about that they mimic each other's goods, and the like. So big distinction is in the theory. And that's, that's really the big takeaway here. Okay, last thing to talk about, we took a look at the efficiency side. We saw that, okay, by a monopolistically competitive market, because they have market power, we face a deadweight loss. Therefore, hey, at Q star, there's my marginal cost. There's my marginal benefit. That is marginal cost no longer equals marginal benefit. Alternatively, marginal cost no longer equals price. I'm no longer allocatively efficient. So we've seen that, hey, by having these kind of firms, we have market failures, right? The market has failed. So this should be raising the question then, hey, hey, if monopolistic competition causes a market failure, how come two thirds about, right? Almost two thirds of the Canadian marketplace are monopolistically competitive firms. Why do we allow this to be the case? Why do we allow so many monopolistically competitive firms to operate? Well, the reason being we have a preference for variety, right? 
the alternative to monopolistically competitive firms would be just the exact same good, no differentiation, right? For t-shirts, we would just have shirt. There wouldn't be any difference. Everyone would just wear a white t-shirt or a gray t-shirt. There would be no differentiation between the different brands. It would just be, here's your white t-shirt. Price is this, right? As it is, we have different prices of t-shirts because, hey, different different producers, they offer different sizes, they offer different designs, they offer different patterns, they offer different styles. And the thing is, is we have a preference for variety. We think we are happier with variety. Here's the problem. We're not happier with variety. We are actually worse off with variety. We would be the best off if our thing, that thing that we prefer, was the only thing. Right? And that is, we go back to this apples example, we would be happy if our favorite apple was this apple here made underneath a perfectly competitive market. If this was our favorite apple, just the traditional apple, great. We'd get this low price, we'd get lots of it being produced, and we'd be allocatively efficient. I would be happy if that was the only apple being made. I don't need variety. This is my apple. The problem is not everybody's like you, right? There are people who are eating this apple, but they don't really love it. And that is as we change, as we begin to offer differentiation, as we begin to offer more variety of products, now there's an apple that exists that's your apple. Unfortunately, because we've introduced variety, we have higher prices, we have lower quantities exchanged, and we have a dead weight loss to society. Again, even though you just found your thing, even though you just found your perfect apple in this case, ironically, you would be better off if your apple again was just the apple, the only apple, the apple that everybody had, again, going back to perfect competition. So that is, we would always be better off if whatever our choice in variety was, was the only choice in variety. The problem is we all have different choices, and we're willing to deal with this social loss. We're willing to deal with these higher prices and lower quantities because we want to ensure that we get our choice of variety. But keep in mind that, hey, variety has a cost, right? And that cost, that social cost of choice is that we deal with higher prices. We deal with social loss due to this dead weight loss. So variety comes at a price. We'd be better off if we just made car, if we just made shirt, if we just made apple, right? We didn't make different versions of them. Society would be better off, but it'd be a pretty dull existence, right? It would be a pretty dull existence. There's kind of another famous kind of example we could use to kind of demonstrate this. And I think I started off the semester with it. I usually do. I might not have done this in my first video. If not, ah, that's too bad. The example goes something like this. It goes, okay, here we go. I'm going to offer to a student a Kit Kat. And you can come up and you can just have this Kit Kat. It's completely free to you. And in this case here, for you to come and get this Kit Kat, you're going to have a cost, right? And your cost to get this Kit Kat is pretty near zero. Right? It's pretty near zero. You have to get up out of your seat if we're in a traditional face-to-face -face setting. You have to get up out of your seat. You have to walk to the front of the class. You have to get your Kit Kat. Very, very low cost in that sense there. Wow. You just got near pure benefit from this Kit Kat, right? And we could say something like your benefit is just fixed at, I don't know, Let's say it's something ridiculous, like you'd get an extra $10 of benefit from your first chocolate bar, your first candy bar. So boom, there you go. I've just essentially given you $10 by giving you that Kit Kat. That's the way that you feel because of it. Okay, let's see if things change if I begin to offer variety, if I begin to offer you choices. So in this case here, same kind of scenario. I say, okay, you can come on up and I will offer you either a Kit Kat or... A coffee crisp. 
Well, now in this case, by offering you either a Kit Kat or a Coffee Crisp, I have now introduced choice. And by introducing choice, I've introduced an opportunity cost. We'll presume the benefit of choosing a Kit Kat is still $10. But we'll presume that our coffee crisp would have had an attached benefit of eight, meaning that by choosing your coffee crisp, you've given, sorry, by choosing the Kit Kat, you've given up the coffee crisp, meaning now in this case here, you've had a cost equivalent to eight that you're lost with the coffee crisp or $10 worth of benefit. That is by giving you choices, I have increased your costs because I've now given you an opportunity cost. And we could keep doing this, right? We could keep offering more and more chocolate bars. We could offer a crunchy, right? Here is a crunchy bar. In this case here, maybe in your mind, you're like, oh man, crunchy bars are really good. And they're both kind of this similar to Kit Kat kind of scenario. It's milk chocolate with like a wafer inside that's pretty crunchy in both cases. Maybe now you see crunchies and Kit Kats as very, very close substitutes. You're still going to go for the Kit Kat because you get the benefit of 10. But uh, you'd say, man, I'd get like 950 benefit from a crunchy. Meaning that as I've increased variety, as I've given you more and more and more options, your opportunity cost, that next best alternative that you've given up, is also increasing. And in this case here, by choosing the Kit Kat over the Crunchy, you now face a cost of $9.50 to get that extra benefit of $10. Right? So what we see is that if we took a look at your net benefit, or kind of your net surplus in each case, in the first case, you received $10 benefit because I only gave you the Kit Kat. By making you make a choice, by giving you more variety, and you're like, no, variety is better. We're better off with variety. Are we? By having this coffee crisp, by making you make this choice, by facing this opportunity cost, you now had to give up the coffee crisp, meaning you now had a cost of eight, meaning your net benefit is now only two. As we added the crunchy, which you saw as a very close substitute, well, now in this case here, you've given up a lot more because ah, the crunchy was a, it was a pretty tight one. You're like, oh, what do I do? Crunchy or Kit Kat? Ah, okay, Kit Kat wins. You're now only getting 50 cents, right? And the more and more choices we offer, the more similar we are in choices, the more difficult it is to choose the one that you would prefer. And ultimately, the lower your net benefit is. I don't know about anybody else, but if you've ever been to Dairy Queen, I face this dilemma every time ordering a Blizzard. There's so many different Blizzard combinations out there. They all look so good. They're all so close in how delicious they're going to be that every time that I order a Blizzard, I just always feel like I'm walking away with no real benefit gained. That it's just like, ah, I just ordered that double chocolate fudge, but ooh, that turtle Blizzard really looked good. Did I make the right choice? Did I make the right choice? Did I really get, was I really maximizing my utility, my happiness, my benefit in that case, or did I make a mistake, right? And the more choices, the more variety we have, the more unsure we are of the choice we've made. So the issue going on there. Okay, so that's our summary of monopolistically competitive firms. Again, to kind of go through what our big learning objectives were and what we've gone through. As we've gone through this, we've seen, okay, the theory behind monopolistically competitive firms, lots of small firms competing over quantity. Because there's lots of small firms, each firm can produce without any worry about what the other firm is doing because each firm is so small in the eyes of the market. Each firm also has a monopoly over their good, right? Each firm is the only one to produce their version. So, okay, that little monopoly over their good gives them a level of market power. From there, we determined our profit maximizing level of Q star, and we witnessed that it looks just like a monopoly situation. And again, that's because they have a monopoly over their good. From there, we then compared and contrasted entry, exit in our monopolistically competitive situation versus perfectly competitive situation. 
we saw that, hey, perfectly competitive and monopolistically competitive firms are both driven to zero profit in the long run. And we saw what that meant as to their location on their long run average cost curves. Perfectly competitive at capacity, at their minimum efficient scale, zero profit. Monopolistically competitive, below capacity, below their minimum efficient scale, at zero profit. We also saw, again, comparison between monopolistically competitive and perfectly competitive. We saw that by having this differentiated goods, by having variety, by having choice, we actually create a market failure. We lower social welfare. And as we wrapped up in this final example, we see our cost of choice. The more choices we have, the higher costs we face, and the more difficult it is to make our right choice. All of that being captured to a degree in this deadweight loss to society. So monopolistic competition in a nutshell, really, as we said, this is our defining market structure of most modern economies. And it creates a market failure, but we're kind of okay with it because even though it creates other problems, even though it causes other costs, we like the idea of choice. We like the idea of variety that we aren't just all the same. So we get some kind of benefit to that that might outweigh that deadweight loss, perhaps subjectively. That does us for this chapter on our kind of market failures and uh, market power. We still have oligopolies to look at, but we're really not going to get into oligopolies and how they cause a market failure. You're just going to have to take my word that they cause a market failure. What we're going to be taking a look at with oligopolies is more this idea of game theory. That is how to play games of strategy, how to figure out what your optimal choice is. That is, for an oligopoly, optimal choice of production, given what your opponent is going to do. Because your opponent influences you and you influence your opponent. So that's where we're going to go in the next week's video. But until then, if you have any questions on monopolistically competitive firms, please feel free to reach out to me through D2L, through email. Thanks. Until next time.